Hello. Hey, good morning. This is Faisal. I'll see if we we're getting John Meadows today. How's everyone doing? Hey, everyone. How are we doing? Hi, Hi everyone. Thanks. And this. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Morning, everyone. Um, so there was massive frenzied activity over the week on the document. It's uh, transformed into lots of additional commentary, which is cool. Is there anyone on the line that uh, is new to the group? Wants to introduce themselves? Anyone hiding in the in the wings? Nope. nope. Um, is does anyone know if Emily's joining us today? She's not. She can't make it today. Can't make it. So I think Emily and uh, Anders, you you guys were driving us pretty nicely. The the last uh, meeting we actually. Uh, Got a lot of stuff done and went nicely through that document. I was going to reach out and ask her to do the same again. But um, should we go and take a look at that document, and see how we're getting on, and uh, share well, well, it together? We'll start there. Let's yep. Do. So, John, uh, just to request. So. Uh, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 Sure. So, just a request. I actually have to pick up my son in 20, min 20 minutes. So, I just wanted to go through my section quickly, just to give everybody a highlight. And then later I can, I mean, then later you guys can discuss and I'll, I'll kind of review. But I just wanted to put my point across uh, because I'll, may ha I, I'll have to leave in 20 minutes. So, I mean, if you possible, want, I I'll want you want to. You want to do that now, Fazel? Because I yeah. know you've done a, a whole chunk of stuff and we got Richard on the line as well that was doing the, um, yeah. the source code piece. Securing yeah. source. So let me share the screen. Okay. Can you guys uh, see the document? Yep. Okay. So, uh, so a couple of points I do want to emphasize that uh, this week my focus was more around adding content. Okay. And right now things might seem here or there, right? I mean, every paragraph is different from the previous one. So eventually the focus this week was that I'll add content more today, uh, sorry, it, this week. And in next week, we can kind of try to smooth out things or try to remove or add things, right? But I think uh, having content was the, I mean, first we need to have content, right? Before we can go through uh, all the phases, right? So, uh, so in securing source code section, what I have done is that um, I have started to add content to it. Okay, and you'll see a lot of content in the, under this section. Uh, but there are three main points that I'm trying to emphasize, right? 
uh, within this section, I'm only focusing on how to secure the source code. That's it, right? I mean, we are not addressing any operational issues. We are not addressing what are the different things around supply chain attacks or we can how we can make things better, right? But this section is purely focused on one uh, agenda and that is how to secure a source code, right? That is the question that we are trying to answer here, right? What are the recommendations around it, right? Uh, there are three categories to it, okay? That I have identified that we should focus on. There might be more, so please, uh, everybody should take this opportunity to add more uh, ideas around it that if, if I'm missing some category. But the first category that I'm trying to identify my recommendations are around identity and access manager, uh, management for the source code repository, right? Source code needs to be somewhere, okay? So what are the, uh, how we can, I mean, what are our recommendations around securing the source code repository itself in terms of recommendations, right? Uh, again, not operational issues. Operational issues can be different things, right? Uh, the second thing that I want to focus in this section, in a subsection is what kind of contribution policies we can establish at the source code repository level that will help us secure the source code, right? So the first thing is identity and access management. And the second thing is what are the different uh, contribution policies that can be set up by, an, uh, by any um, administrator or any uh, enterprise to, to kind of secure the repository, right? Uh, and again, this is to help the secure the source code only, okay? And the third thing is how to establish non-repudiation and integrity at the source code level, okay? So these are the three sections uh, that I'm trying to categorize information in. If you find later on that there is any other section, please add to it and just add a few comments around it. Then, then we can take, take it beyond, right? Uh, so then each section starts identity and access management. Uh, Richard has uh, added a lot of information here. Okay, so thanks Richard, right? Uh, again, in recommendation, then we are going for recommendations right now right for each of these sections that we have described okay what are our recommendations okay so in the justification section we are trying to add some information background to it why mfa is needed this is just an example right uh, we, we can shorten it we can uh, I, I mean it depends eventually when we will refine or sweep the whole code what we do but with each section, what uh, we'll try to do is that we'll add recommendations around it, okay? That what are our recommendations for each of these subsections, right? And uh, th they can be different, right? MFA, SSH keys, okay? How to rotate SSH keys should be rotated, okay? User access tokens, okay? And, and there are different recommendations. Uh, I'm still writing something around roles, okay? so that we can enable four eyes principle uh, as recommended uh, uh, by Emily. So, hey, Fazal, the only thing, and so I know we kind of talked about this on, on our call the other day. Um, these are general IEM recommendations. They could apply to every single part of the system, every system that's gonna be part of these, these steps. So my, my question for the overall purpose of the paper, you know, when, when I, I wrote it, I was really focused at contributing source code to a, a source code hosting platform. Um, and, and like, I know that all the like enabling MFA, you know, we know that that's something you need to have MFA as well on any of these systems on your, on, you know, logging into Jenkins, you know, whatever, whatever's going to be doing your build, any of your security software, like uh, testing tools, all those are going to probably also need that same sentence. So the question I had was, are we going to copy all of these recommendations across the paper or are we going to have, you know, it, 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 that's the part where I was like, why yes, are we, why are we justifying it here versus yes. anywhere else? Yes. So uh, th that's a great point. Okay. But this is only related to MFA and I, I will emphasize, right? SSH keys, you may not need it for Jenkins. Okay. These recommendations are specific to how to access and uh, how to do IAM around source code repositories. For other systems, it might be different. MFA is a thing that you can say is general in nature, 
but underneath other recommendations if you see around these are specific to source code repositories i mean there are i mean for example you say how to access amazon right or uh, aws services right they will have their own recommendations right how to store your iam credentials and things around it right but the recommendation that i am giving here they are more specific to how to manage iam around source code repositories or you can call it a hosting platform or a devops platform anything we will will come back to the terminology but these recommendations are specific to source code repositories personal access tokens and these things i mean these things are different okay for different uh, other parts of the system okay so i do not think so that you will you will share this information with other sections the only thing that can be shared is mfa right because it's generally um, i mean in general right now there is a trend right you need mfa for everything right i mean you are accessing website as well you need mfa right but but again here i'm trying to emphasize this solar wind attack that happened okay and where this thing happened right because there was a credential issue there there i mean just read through this section okay with mfa we may want to we may want to place this section somewhere else but if you look at all other recommendations they have to be here because they are more directly related to source code repositories they are not they are not a general in nature i mean uh, I, i wonder if to richard's point there there are two layers one that is overarching for all the paper and at that level it might be least privilege and onto a specific sections it becomes more more targeted more implementation is specific to how it yeah. pertains to that particular area and at that point it would be easier of like hey uh here is how we're applying this overarching principle uh in this particular section richard is that what you're thinking or you you'd like structure yeah. frame it different it I, I just I uh, the thing I worry about is us writing the same sections over and over again. Yeah, uh, that's that's kind of my my key thing here. When I think about this section, I think about it. I'm starting an open source project. I want to know what CNCF thinks is the most secure way of communicating with GitHub. Uh, um, there should be a very focused list of like, okay, make sure your users have MFA enabled. Make sure you're using SSH keys and not using HTTP, HTTPS. Uh, make sure if you're it, Yeah. Uh, do you basically make do you want to say that or not? Right? Actually, I want to ask that before we finish this. Um, you're recommending both um, uh, HTTP and HTTPS uh, or SSH keys and personal access tokens, but yes. then you, I think you go on to say you're recommending HTTPS over person over SSH. I mean, do you want to completely drop SSH? I mean, we're providing one option, right? Isn't is it we're a well, best practice generally a categorical? So I, I think there's confusion and I put a comment in here. The use of access tokens is not for developers. That's not- You to, can. Like, you, you can, you could, I mean, you can do a lot of things, but I don't yeah. think I've ever been anywhere where you- I mean, where, you I've know, worked, I'm, I'm, that's my, my current job. We also, from an operational perspective, is fewer protocols. There's no SSH. Mm -hmm. I only have HTTPS ingress into my environment. Right. Um, So there actually are a number of reasons to pick one over the other. Those aren't these answers. That's not for this. That's an operations answer. But um, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. So I, this, yep. yeah, this, as, as written, I, I know everything's in progress in this document. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so personally, uh, again, this is what I added this morning as well, right? So, so in my view as well, both are the option and this is how I'm trying to put it here in the document as well, SSH is an option, okay? And there are issues around it, right? I mean, it is secure because it also creates an encrypted ch channel. I mean, you can see uh, in this section what I have written, right? Yeah. But if you can, you should go for personal access token, right? But personal access token, again, they are more oriented toward build agents, CI, CD pipeline agents and things like that. So that's why I have put this yeah. comment in red you, that you need to more focus on yeah. when we describe this thing that, okay, for build agents right now, let's recommend this thing. Okay. But for yeah. use developers, let's try to focus on SSH keys some way. Right. So uh, the description is there, uh, uh, but in general, uh, I agree overall that if you have personal access token, they should be preferred. 
and uh, I, I I miss. I mean, I, I cannot re, uh, I have to rephrase this sentence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, that's because, exactly what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, because uh, from operational point of view, right? I, I know what you're trying to get at, right? And this is what, uh, what is my experience too, that uh, that HTTPS is from network security teams will say, okay, HTTPS, good. SSH, okay, let me review the system. Okay, so uh, again, uh, add comments. I'll add more things mm -hmm. to it, but I will add, I will recommend both the things. We shouldn't remove any of them, okay? Mm -hmm. Because uh, because there are scenarios where SSH keys will be preferred by open source community. It is, there, there are many reasons for yeah. it, right? SSH, yeah, it's not gonna go away, but yeah. I'm not sure if I might strengthen a statement of one is preferred over the other. I mean, there are other weaknesses of SSH. You have RNG problems, protocol, like um, crypto gets old over time. Like those concerns are not present with a token because typically a token can be manually expired in compromise or can um, typically has a one-year expiration or you pick a time frame when you issue it. Yeah. So like, there, there are, are like there are a lot of nice reasons that. Yeah, yeah. like advantage. just because I'm I'm quite I'm, I just want to make sure that there's no confusion when we're talking about using personal access Developer. tokens. For a developer, for literally as as my, I'm not going to have an SSH. Uh, like I will not configure yeah. my hosting platform. I, if you were starting a an open source project today and you wanted to be as secure as possible, you would require your developers to use personal access tokens rather than the SSH. I'm not that sure. Always okay. communicated with. On the, the I am, this may happen less in open source, I think, and I might actually agree with you again. But particularly in a like, you host your own environment. Um, because I've know. never encountered this period. I get that it, it could be incredibly, yeah. it, it's significantly more secure. I'm curious about the fact that you then have to do a whole separate credentials management system for those personal access tokens. Uh, I mean, you can't just- You, had to, do a, you had to do a management system for your private keys of SSH too. Abs absolutely. So, I mean, it's trading is... one for the other. It's yeah. one, in, that, that, in that respect, they're equivalent. Yeah. So the main is um, these expire as an advantage. Um, they're always more fine grained. You can make um, keys down, expire yeah. too, and you yeah. Can the have upside that of keys policy. is you have public key. A public key is sometimes an advantage, which is actually a major advantage of SSH. That yeah, Blake, you can stick public keys everywhere. So yeah, there's. We need to consider. Let's keep going. Let's just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, so, uh, so, so get in the get in the comments, Blake. Yeah. So so in, in so order guys, to keep going, should one of you put in there that this is for developers and make the distinction between yeah. the developer yeah. and machine? Yeah. And, and Richard, sounds like there's yeah. already enough for perhaps you to start putting principles in the executive summary. Maybe the place is the executive summary of here are the high level things you should be doing across end to end. And these things may may be realized differently depending on the place where you where you do it. Uh, I did change the face. I changed the pat is should be preferred to is preferred. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now that we have the content, <laughs> I think we can push yeah. like a more assertive <laughs> voice. But if you guys feel that, hey, uh, yeah, if, to your point, Blake, single yeah. recommendation, we should agree yeah. on a single recommendation. And it's yeah. getting people to where they should be versus what is viable today. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, again, uh, Please go through this document. Okay, I have a couple of minutes. I just want to go through the whole section. I know there there can be a heated debate, right, on these things, right? But overall, um, I, I have added all the content, okay, and I because I also use personal access tokens to manage my infrastructure, okay. So I do know about them, and that's why I have added all these comments here. If you have anything additional, go for it. Add content. Let me know what you think about it, okay. But again, I just want to go through this whole section quickly so that then I can just kind of drop and then I give it to you guys yep. to kind of discuss, right? Uh, again, uh, I am then I am, uh, we need to uh, articulate this uh, topic heading well, but we need to define roles, right? Because roles can help us to uh, define permissions, uh, enforce 4i principles and different things. So all these recommendations come around IAM, right? This first section that I identified then in the next section as well, in terms of contribution policies, again, I have given all the recommendations that I think should be there, like branch protections, require signed commits. Uh, we should prevent committing secrets to the source code, how to do it. And then there is this option as well, right? And 
This is the only section I'm confused about. Should it be here? Configure security and vulnerability analysis features. Should it be in the, uh, or somewhere else? Or in this section of contrib configuring contribution policies at the source code repository level. So again, guys, just go through this section. I have added a lot of content here. I mean, if you have more recommendations, add it, okay? But again, please keep in mind, I'm trying to focus on the security aspect, not the operational aspect, okay? So that mm -hmm. has to be understood. And then in the end, I have this section establishing non-repudiation and in integrity at the source code level, right? And there are two ways to use uh, do it, GPG and SMIME, okay? In the end, we will recommend GPG keys because they are more prevalent, okay? And they should be used for... Um, for the establishing non-repudiation and integrity. But generally there are two options, okay? Um, so just go through all these sections, okay? I have added my comments on the right as well. There were a few questions. What is the thought process and what I'm thinking about this whole section, okay? How, how to present it. But, but this is the high level three categories that I am thinking. If you find more categories, right? please let me know. But in my view, if we present these three categories and recommendations under these three categories, I think we are good, at least on securing source code. Okay, okay so it's cool. a number list. Should these come, like you're, you're thinking they have a sense of priority or order of operations, uh, one takes precedence, should it be a bulleted list over a number list? Do you feel strongly about that? Um. I don't have any, uh, I mean, um, I haven't thought about this thing to, or to be honest, right now, my, my point was that, okay, these three things need to be established and then I'm generally giving recommendations. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, saying this one takes more preference, right? They are general recommendations and uh, we can take a different approach. It's interest. It's interesting um, kinding, kind of, giving more priority. Yeah. But right now I haven't thought my agenda for this week was have content yeah. and now we can all dig in and refine it and yeah. complete. I think, I think that's great, Pizar, right? There's a lot of really good content there, a lot of, a lot of good thoughts, right? I, I think it's something that we can now take a look at, right? It's, it's At least we can go through now as a group later on and sort of edit it and perhaps as we were saying earlier on, pull some of it back up to maybe it's more generic thoughts or, or even some of it in some form of an appendix and just try to sort of refine it so that we get nice, clear um, recommendations out to people. And one of, one of the other things I was thinking about during the, the, the sort of discussion we had there was, you know, do some of this break into different separations of, of um, security sensitivity, right? Is that, you know, some of it okay for, for the moderate and, and basic security. And then if you jump up to, uh, you know, a, a, an air gap network, maybe it's easier to, to use one version, one issue of, or one approach yes. over the other, right? Yes, Th um, this, this will be considered eventually. Once we have finalized the content, we will assign this um, moderate or high, I, yeah. I mean, we will itemize this thing. Uh, I have to drop, guys. I have to pick up myself. No, I, think I really apologize, right? But overall, uh, yeah, please go through the document. The content is there. I will add more content to it, but I did now want to refine it as well, right? Mm -hmm. And hopefully, I have conveyed my point, what I was thinking when writing this section, okay? Yep. No, it's great. Thanks for the, the detailed content on that one. Thank you. Um, awesome. So Thank you. So just just trying to get back to the top of that document, I guess, or, or look at what uh, additional people have, have added in. Do we want to go through uh, the people on the call and, and in the similar way that Fazal has done, um, sort of highlight the area or the section that you've taken on and give a quick update? But you know, we've got a lot of people on the call, right? So maybe like five minutes or less uh, on anything that you want to bring to people's attention for a bit of bit of feedback or a bit of area that you need help on, a bit of area uh, that you're not quite sure about. Should we go through that? Maybe if you're not, yeah. you, you want to have a go? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, John. Let me see if I can share. Can you share? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure if I can. Share. Can you share the screen, uh, John, the document, if you don't mind? Yeah, let me give it a go. Um, so I have added the generation of SMOM. So I just want to clarify what I mentioned there. And uh, I just want to know how how far we should go in the generation of SMOM. So can you where go are you that? going there? If, you know, uh, let me find out where where you're at. Generation of SMOM. Yeah. It used to be close to the, it used to be at the top. Now we've got a lot of additional content there. <laughs> 
There we go. Examining S bomb. Uh, it's down. It's called generation method that let me see. Whereabouts? Which let page me, is it? Let me find the page. Let's see. Also, I feel like the document keep going back to older version. I'm not sure it's just for me. Like uh, last time I made some changes and it's going back again to an older version or something. I don't know if others notice the same I, issue. Like I, I have the same problem. I, I'm part of me. I was like, man, we should do this in Git. And then I realized, no, this is this is how things die is when you make people do Word documents in Git. Uh, well, I think I think Emily, Emily was <laughs> suggesting that the last time, well, maybe Anders, you can give us a bit of insight. And when you guys were doing the um, the Spiffy Inspire document, you didn't you like everyone do it in in Google Docs and then start to version it out or something? We had a dog per chapter, you know, and two three people per chapter at a time. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so. Yeah, John, I put it in the chat. Uh, so yeah, I found it. I hope it is. You can also find it. Uh, otherwise, I will see if I can share my screen. I cannot share. Okay. Can you find it? Production of uh, software artifact uh, and associated metadata. So if you put as bomb in bracket, you can find it. Yeah. Production of. There we go. Got it. So yeah, so in this area, I mainly focus on a, a, I think we need to rephrase that title also. Maybe uh, I think the so software artifact will be produced as a part of the build process, right? So I, I was just focusing on how the s bomb itself being produced. So, you know, so we, we, we can have multiple ways to generate s bomb, right? One, one way to generate is during the build process using the build information from build or package management tools or how the uh, the software itself is uh, produced so we can generate s bomb from that data the other data is a uh, software composition analysis like uh, once you have a software you can generate also you know reverse engineer and going back to find the the components inside the software so there are different kind of tools currently available in the market like uh, it's uh, some of them support both uh, SPDS and Cyclone DL, yeah. some of them just for a Cyclone or just for SPDS, right? Been, so I think those... just, just wondering what your recommendation is here, right? I mean, it, it's we, we should definitely rec we should definitely generate them. Um, yeah. But is there any recommendation of, of how or, you know? I mean, I put uh, the one, right? So my, I mean, with my testing, early testing and the trials, I find that, uh, you know, the build process tools has more accuracy because you know they can find actually what what exactly the software is built of right like a like maven tools or a, a node or some kind, whatever the build tool if it is a gradle or maven if we can use in that build process we can have more accuracy in the s bomb compared to the reverse engineering right. or a manual process right so manual is a, you know if we have to use it we will have to use okay. manual right but yeah do, do you need any help on that section to to yeah. So I, I, I want to ask, uh, do we need to give some example or uh, do we need to give some more detail how far we should go with the generation of s bomb, right? Like, uh, uh, or is it just high level information and these are the tools available open source? So I just put open source tool at the moment, like how to generate s bombs, yeah. Well, my, my gut feel, right, was if there's anything open source already out there, use that. If there's anything CNCF, prioritize that. Uh, and at least provide some actual guidance on you know which of those tools to to execute. And if if there's a gap and one doesn't exist, uh, and there's not a decent tool, then we identify it as a gap and we take it as something that we might want to come back to and and, and actually implement the solution. Right? Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe that's that's an option to take on. That'd be my my yeah. gut feel for that. But at the same time, the landscape is you know we need to consider the technology landscape. Not all technology. Like uh, I'm saying, Go language. There are so many other programming languages, right? So not all programming language may have a own plugin yep. or build tools yep. to generate a bomb, right? So there are other challenges in general, right? So yeah. Yep. Yep. 
all cloud native. Yeah, I think it's really important that not all software, not all cloud native software is written in Go and runs in Kubernetes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really important just to to talk about the point that you know whatever programming tool that we're using, whether it be Go or some esoteric language, you know, however that that tool records the packages that it uses in the build process, that needs to be recorded in the SPDX format. All right, so there's tools that don't exist and are going to need to be built to do some of these, like, it, let's say ADA, right? We need to build an SPX for an ADA. I don't have any idea how to do that, nor does many people, right? But I, I'm sure it can be done if we, if we talk about that in a high level. Sorry. Yeah. So yep. Sorry, Blake. I was going to ask, are we recommending one or the other over SPDX versus Cyclone DX? I think, yeah, I I think want that's to where add... we get into. So at the moment in, in that list, I haven't. So I put both, right? Like both SPDS and Cyclone. Uh, in fact, the Cyclone has more support for existing build tools and plugins. Yeah. But uh, you know, I, I've also put SPDS and there are common one like uh, Anger, Swift, uh, sorry, the, yeah. the second link that support both generation, both SPDS and Cyclone. That's exactly what it's probably spelled out here. It's probably recommend to use a standardized tool and comment that their integrations with the ecosystem vary. I don't know. Is, is there some function that will take SPDX and convert it to Cyclone DX and back and forth? No, I mean, is that- I don't know if that's a loss. Right? That I mean, I think you probably could do it, but I don't know. I don't know these formats enough. So if that's a loss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a minimum, you know, support for all these SPDS, uh, Cyclone and SPD or something, the, the three main ones. But you know they have minimum mapping, right? But it's not a full mapping for all these standards. But there are tools like, as an example, OWASP dependency track, which consume both SPDS and Cyclone, and it will convert. So you can, in theory, you know, you can import one format and generate other format mm -hmm. from that tool also. So okay. there are different options. All right. And the other thing I kind of want to know is, hey, what should be in the SBOM, right? Are we talking about what kind of metadata? Is it just a package metadata or is there some other things that we want to put in there? I think yeah, some guidance around that would be would be really yeah. helpful. I yeah, think that's that that's, that's mostly dictated by the standard itself, right? So that's how the star, SPDS and Cyclones varies. They have their own minimum required data in the spec itself, right? So, you know, I think in our case, we need to, at least in my view, like we need to at least identify what packet is that, what version is that, where is that uh, originated, or where is the source code. And these are the like uh, minimum attributes out there, like uh, in both uh, uh, SPDS and Cyclone DX, right? right? But if you want to have more data, we need to you know, think what all we need to have there, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, cool, all right, and, and do you need any assistance with that, Vinod? It sounds like you, you, you're deep in the weeds there. I mean, I, I was told that someone else is, with, I was supposed to ask it someone else there. Like, I don't remember that guy's name, but I think it's your Ion channel guy. So, but uh, I, I didn't saw any update from him. So that's why I jumped in today okay. and update it. But I, no, I appreciate it. Maybe reach yeah. out to him on the on the Slack and see if he's still interested. Yeah, definitely. I, I will reach out nice. to him. Yeah. All right, thanks, Vinod. Should we, should we switch? Uh, who's up next? Uh, I know Cole. Uh, and, and Michael, you you were adding stuff. Cole, did you um, do you want to give an update yeah. on the stuff? Yes, yes, yes. Hold on one second. Let me pull up my area here, and then I'll share my screen. Uh, nice link. Oops. All right. Oh yeah, you can share. Yep. Okay, software factory. All right, so... Wow, you're gonna have to zoom, I think. That's quite some screen you got there, right? <laughs> Here we go, that should be better. Uh, so I added some additional sections uh, here. I need to do a little bit more on uh, testing, connect and wiring, provision deploy. <clears throat> Um, so that, that's going to just be knocking that out. If someone wants to take some of that or help with some of that, would really appreciate it. Um, you can just assign yourself to maybe one of those subsections. Um, otherwise, I will be continuing on. 
Uh, you know, one thing I did do um, that we hadn't talked about before really probably deserves some discussion is defining a different user roles, right? Um, have this idea of segregating responsibilities of the software factory <coughs> into different different roles uh, with the checks and balances between those roles, right? So you have like a policy maintainer, right? The idea is that the policy is kind of decoupled from the software factory that gives you the constraints on what users can and can't right. do, right? That should be in, your encoded in, organizational policy should be encoded in that with the with the constraints, right? And who and defines then, the pipeline, right? Or the the um you know, the specific pipelines going to use. Cool. Yeah, you know, they'll, they'll define either the pipeline templates like in, in the idea of platform one and some RBAC rules for developers, uh, automation around, you know, when you when you instantiate a new project, what um, uh, what permissions does that project have? Where does that project get deployed to, right? So that, that's all policy uh, that should be encoded. Um, then you have um, developers, you know, those are the end users, right? So you, you should have, depending on, you know, how large your organization is, right? You may have a federated model for this, uh, for your developers um, uh, in order, you know, so you may have many, many, many groups of, of developers that don't have access to each other's projects. And then you have factory administrators, right? They're responsible, they're like the SRE group for the software factory responsible for innovation and um, the general maintenance and uptime, uh, make, making sure that they hit their SLAs. Nice. Did, did you get into any, one of the things I, I thought about over the week and, and, and last week was the generation of the hardened containers in the first place uh, and making sure that we create a, a a pipeline to generate those containers or where you'd get those containers from or the API or requirements for those containers specification? Um, so as far as just like what the image should look like for hardened containers, no, I did not get into that. Um, uh, I did, go ahead. No, it, it was just that, that that that's kind of my thought is that you, you, you and you know to go back to the DoD right it's all the cool work that's heading into the iron bank and, and leveraging those containers in the middle of the software factory it's it's identifying we've got a really good software factory implementation we're talking about but it's really the 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 real heart of the matter is what what does and doesn't go into those containers that are actually created and how they're hardened in the first place now maybe that's not you know, in terms of best practice it's like you're going to be a user of that platform and you know, if you go and use it, but it's kind of advice on how to create that container, or maybe even it's advice, just go and use the iron bank. That's one mm -hmm. way to do it. So, yeah, it's, I think that goes into, you know, where's your repository at? And start talking about that. <laughs> or are you talking more of like a bottom turtle problem, Jonathan? No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm talking about the, the actual, um, hardened containers that you're going to string together within that software factory itself, right? So that each of the individual tasks you're going to put together within that pipeline, right? You know, one's going to have build in it, one's going to have SAST in it, one's going to have uh, some sort okay. of scan tool, one's going to have a test tool within it. You're going to chain them all together and how do you actually create those containers? Those images, Okay, sorry. right, right. So we talk about the steps here of, of what a pipeline is. Um, and all the steps that a pipeline needs to have in order to produce a hardened container, um, right? So we have, you know, functional testing, end-to-end -end testing, right? So we know that it works and it matches yep. the, the specification. Um, and I think, you know, verification right here, right? That, that's an aspect of hardening, validation of the build process, right? So these are the steps that go into a process. I think, well, there needs to be some sort of a diagram here to make that more apparent and say, hey, these are the steps that go into it. Um, and this is what your end product looks like. It, or maybe it needs to have like a different uh, introduction or a title or something. What, your, what are your thoughts? Can you put a diagram in there? Or do you, you just- Diagrams are good. Maybe I'm looking at it from a completely different angle, Cole, and, and that you, your output there for that entire section is how to create a single container within that software factory or whether it's... John, we're, we're in 40 minutes. Do you want to take this one with Cole? Yeah. In a breakout? Okay, cool. Um, really by the way. Yeah, good, good work, good work on that.
Um, so, so yeah, Cole, you, let's see you and I get together and we'll go through that one. Yeah, I got a little um, bit of time right after this. If you cool. do. Yep, know. me too. Um, Michael, do you want to sure. step in? How are you getting on? Yep. Uh, okay, let me share my screen here. Um, so uh, a lot of stuff uh, uh, in here, mostly about the build worker and the, the securing the build infrastructure. I know that there's um, probably some overlap between some of the other pieces. And, and as we kind of um, evolve, uh, I'm sure some of this might go in other areas or, or whatever. Um, but uh, I think the big, uh, the biggest piece, I think, as far as the securing is like what, what to do about the bill worker. Um, bunch of stuff in here, but the, the highlights, uh, and I have this in my notes somewhere down here. Um, so the big things I think uh, that I've done in the past um, is, you know, uh, the build worker should be single use. Um, why? Well, if the build gets compromised, uh, then your build worker is fundamentally compromised at that point. So if you're not constantly sort of refreshing your build worker, whether it's like a container or a VM or something else, um, then, then you're potentially building on a compromised worker. Uh, you know, the, the main sort of principles um, around it are sort of have a golden image that should ostensibly only keep track, uh, sorry, should only include the, uh, the tooling that is needed for the build. So like keep that image as, as minimal as possible. So if you're compiling GCC or whatever, it should really only have GCC and some other few things to just support that it shouldn't you know consist of like it shouldn't you shouldn't have a build worker that is for um java plus gcc plus all those other things it's it's way too much um attack surface um the other thing that i think is uh big is you know the build environment so that sort of consists of the dependencies and and the sources that you're going to be uh, then using to build uh your artifact and so the, the big thing there that, um, you know, suggesting is that build environment should be um, created for the build worker. So uh, as much as possible, that build worker should be more or less, um, you know, not completely necessarily air gapped, but it should be air gapped in the sense that it should not have network access. It should be using stuff like shared drives, uh, sorry, shared, net, uh, shared storage. And those sorts of things, such that you know the pipeline will be um, creating the, uh, or sorry, creating the build environment, which would include its sources and dependencies for the build worker, and then the build worker just knows to pick up um, its uh, build environment from uh, storage, and then the build command itself should also be passed into the build worker. You know, if it's a container, you imagine it's just when I run the container, I tell it, hey, here's the command. And the command should, um, for the most part, uh, just consist of something like a, um, you know, compile this thing or whatever, plus usually something like, um, here is the signature of the build environment that you should be looking at and, you know, um, validating. And then the output should be an artifact, which is get, which gets written to another, um, piece of uh, shared storage, which then, you know, the pipeline orchestrator would then pick up and then on the build worker's behalf, upload that to an artifact repository because, uh, you know, there's just too much um, going on in the, you know, given that the build worker, right, is running potentially arbitrary code in building the artifact, um, there's way too much stuff going on to give it sort of network access because then, you know, if you say, hey, I'm going to allow this to push artifacts, you can't really be sure whether or not it pushed the artifact it said it built and, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of um, a lot of it behind the build worker, also sort of limiting the build worker to as much as possible, just sort of a single sort of process. So if it's if you're building, you know, um, multiple artifacts and then linking those artifacts together in some sort of step, it's much better to have all of those be individual builds. Uh, have the pipeline orchestrator sort of orchestrate all of that over time because then uh, it be becomes much easier to then audit after the fact that if one of those builds was compromised, you have a much better chance of catching which of the builds was compromised rather than, hey, if you have a sort of a, a monolithic build, then you're kind of, um, you know, uh, it becomes significantly harder because you have, you know, it could be building multiple artifacts and you don't know which uh, step 
is uh, what failed um, or what uh, got compromised. Uh, one note, really quick. Yeah. Um, I, th I think I agree with most of what you said. Uh, one thing I might note, one of the major advantages also to blocking the internet egress is um, you get a more accurate idea of what your dependencies are. Um, you can't yep. pull dependencies in from the internet. Yes. So it forces yeah. you to have captured all your dependencies prior to the build, which is actually a big deal. Yeah, that's great. Yep. Um, that's so the main reason we use it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And actually, one of the things along those lines, which is not necessarily captured in here, because I don't think it necessarily um, is part of this, but it's something that I do think uh, needs to be either discussed or captured somewhere, is um, so one of the things that made a lot of this sort of work for me in the past is by um, building sort of a Merkle tree of the dependencies and building a Merkle tree of also the signatures of in, you know, the things that you're um, building, which has allowed us to sort of say, hey, if your artifact essentially self-describes its, um, its tree of dependencies, it makes it much easier to kind of say, well, this is not a, a valid signature because that signature is not based on the hash of the other stuff that uh, creates that artifact and becomes much easier to know like, oh, well, I know that this, um, you know, if I'm, if I built all of its dependencies, there's some amount of signatures for each of those dependencies uh, that are essentially based on the hashes of uh, those dependencies. And then when I'm building the final artifact, well, the final artifact is essentially, it's a hash based on, or, you know, it's a hash which consists of the signature of the final artifact which itself is also based on the, you know, validating the hashes of all the previous dependencies. Um, now, I haven't seen too many folks sort of take that approach outside of OS tree. Um, OS tree seems to really be pushing that sort of model. Um, Nix is another package manager that I see sort of dip its toe in there. Uh, but it's something that, um, at a previous place, uh, we sort of more or less developed internally. And it wasn't all that difficult uh, to do because I know that to some extent, Basil and Pants and some of those yeah. other build systems sort of do the same sort of thing. And so by doing that, that kind of allowed us to sort of say, hey, when, when um, securing the build workers, uh, it made it much easier to sort of say, hey, the build worker exported something that doesn't match up with what we have upstream because it has to be based on the, uh, the hashes of the dependencies and it's giving me something that appears to not match up. So and that made it easier to sort of catch those um, issues. Else? Um, exactly what you're saying. I think Intoto actually does some of that. I believe it okay. signs as inputs and signs as outputs. It signs a hash of all of its input files individually and it signs a hash of all of its output files individually which is not quite a Merkle chain in the same way, but if you post build validate all the, those chain together, you've got a very similar validation. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just one more item in X space. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So I've been a little, I've been a few years out of th that whole space. So I'm, I'm a little unfamiliar with, with some of the newer tools, but yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and then, so I mostly sort of focused on, uh, to go back to sort of the build worker real quick, um, mostly focused on the build worker stuff, mostly trying to um, provide guidance around, you know, for example, try and remove anything that is really not related to the build from the build worker. So, you know, if you don't need Vim on the build worker, don't include Vim in the golden image. Um, you know, the as much as possible, it, the build worker's dependencies should be given to it as opposed to having the build worker pull in its dependencies because it's much easier to kind of have a something like a pipeline orchestrator that its only responsibility is just to sort of move the pieces around to have that push um, you know, the build environment to the uh, build worker. And then the same way that the output of the build worker can then be pulled by the pipeline orchestrator push to uh, whatever. And then you know, the pipeline orchestrator will take all that data and do whatever it needs to do uh, with it. Um, there's a bunch of other pieces. Oh, sorry. So, so sorry to Michael and So just want to clarify there when you mentioned build worker, right? So I think most of build tools in the market, like, uh, you know, uh, even 
uh, you know maven gradle or uh, you know what are the tools that we have right most of them works on the pull model right when they need to build a software if they can't find in cache they pull it from the uh, remote repo or whatever repo they have configured. Nice. Can, so, can I just can I just jump in a sec? We've only really got 10, 10 minutes left, unfortunately. Um, I just wonder if we, we want to take this one as a bit of a sidebar, because uh, sure. again, it's a huge amount of good content, right? Maybe pick this up on Slack or, or a separate conversation. Just keen on making sure we get uh, get a few minutes with everyone else on the call. Are, are there others that are? Um, Others that have been able to uh, contribute that haven't haven't talked so far, Marina, Mikhail. Um, I added a Did couple you? of comments in the um, signing section, which I think is a couple below this. It's not quite text yet, but it's a couple of of thoughts, really. Um, yeah, and I can I can later turn those into something more like text. I didn't have a chance this week. Okay, no worries, no worries. Um, anyone else? Mikhail, Aditya? Uh, I, was, I was able to add a bit to the distribution mechanism. Uh, so I, I basically approached it in the sense of uh, what properties we want any, you know, uh, any distribution mechanism must have. And I borrowed pretty heavily from the properties that Duff offers. And, and I think it does make a lot of sense to, especially for the CNCF to recommend using for distribution mechanisms. Yeah, I mean, it's perfect sense, right? Do, do you need any help with? I mean, you you are you are in you are from exactly the right place to opine upon that, right? <laughs> I doubt you need much help. But uh, I, I I think I could use some help, uh, or at least someone to discuss a couple yep. of things with uh, with respect to handling metadata specifically. Especially, yep. uh, I think there was some discussion about handling metadata internally. Yeah. That I, that. That's a scenario I'm not really familiar with, so I'd like to go over that. I can give you a hand with that. So it's cool. the, um, this week's been tough, but I can give you a hand with that one. So mm -hmm. let, let's catch up on that one. Any, sure. Anyone else that's, that's added? Yeah, I, I didn't add much uh, there. Uh, Joe was just reading and understanding what was there. But uh, I'm wondering if there was any discussions around uh, code obfuscation uh, on the protecting the source code there, and, and if that's relevant for this, this document. Drop it in. Sorry? Yeah. Drop, go, go drop it in. Put it, put it okay. in there. In that sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I'll, add, I'll add that. Yeah, today or tomorrow. But yeah, I'll do that. Awesome. Yeah. And yeah, nice job on the article your team got published. Mm -hmm. that's okay. Pretty, pretty good. And yeah, yeah, I'm really, really keen to see you and, and Andy, Andy Martin, the perspective you bring as, as red teamers mm -hmm. onto this as, as we're thinking very defensively about it. But sure. I'm sure, sure no you're problem. close to Coke. Yeah, yeah. I'll focus more. Uh, my focus would be more on the source code stuff. That's my uh, prior uh, background experience on, on application security. So, so yeah, but I'll try to add some stuff from this article as well there. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, and, and feel free to reference it to be sure rather than, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, on, on a separate note, I think I uh, over the next few days, I'll probably be kind of, you know, jumping in on a couple of places and securing the pipeline, which I think Cole is working on. And uh, I haven't taken a look at securing the build yet, but but I am curious to see where uh, Intoto makes sense and in a few of those different places. So I'll probably also be awesome. either leaving comments or making suggestions. Cool. Andy, you were trying to chip in there, but I think you're on mute. Yeah, I constantly forget this microphone is flying above my head when I'm uh, <laughs> drinking my alcohol-free beer. I, That's I not alcohol-free. No, you. <clears throat> not even you're not getting away with that. <laughs> Genuinely, I, I protest too much. The uh, yeah, my contributions are yet to land. I have everything uh, printed out, but uh, it's, it's been so much activity that I'm actually only halfway through and going to start again. So uh, I will have something more useful for next week. But it looks awesome. I'm so impressed with uh, the bits that I've read through so far. Excellent. Is, is anyone uh, anyone contributed or added that uh, hasn't uh, discussed it today? Anyone? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so I've added a few things around signing artifacts, and thanks to to Michael and Maria for that added commentary. Uh, I think it'd be worth 
having some help around validation and signatures at deployment and runtime. I think there's a bunch of different components working amongst there, such as Toto, SBOM, uh, artifact distribution or signatures, uh, GPG. Um, so I think there's some affinities with uh, some of the previous headings. So I wonder if there's someone who could um, help in that section. Any any take? Has anyone around for that? Um, do, do you want to drop a, a text to that effect into the Slack channel, Gary? And if uh, if if I get time after helping out the detail, I'll, I'll try and drop into that too. Oh, yep, we'll do. I think that'd be useful. Any I'll, anyone I'll else? I'll, I'll drop in there as well. But it would be awesome. good to add other people in there too. Excellent. A any other areas that people think are uh, either a bit light or they're on and they need a bit of help? Nope. I think we're in good shape. I um, think there's, by the way, I think there's a huge amount of content in there looking pretty awesome now. Yeah, Cole? yeah just one comment oh, there. Sorry, yeah, yeah, on the 2FA part, like I didn't see any, uh, I'm not sure, uh, I didn't see any specifications on the type of 2FA to use. Like either as a mask or like an uh, app on, on your cell phone or a physical token, right? Like a UV key. Uh, do you guys think that's uh, relevant or not? I specify in my section, I did specify tokenized 2FA. I don't know if that's a good characterization of the type of 2FA we want to use or if there's another term that, that, that works better. I mean, don't rule out smart cards either. I don't think but, we should I mean, recommend them for everybody, but don't rule them out. Yeah, maybe we can have some degrees of like how how secure you want to to protect your code, right? So like what level of security you want, and yeah. then you, you can have like okay, any two FA is fine, and then maybe the app two FA is a second level, and then the physical two FA is a third level of security. Yeah, I think that's one of the things we're trying to trying to do, trying to start, you know separate out. Look, this is moderate, this is high. We can certainly add to that. Yeah, I like I like I like the the approach of, of the levels there. The, like what they have on the OASP Open SAM document that they have some levels of like best practices for for application yeah. security and and secure coding. Uh, so I like yeah. that approach as well. Again, it sounds like Auth needs to move probably like early in the document to a section of its own because this is sure. again a common item. Okay. Yeah, I think we're sort of getting to that point, aren't we? Where it look, there's the common item section Auth, you know, yeah. uh, I am and such. Uh, great. Uh, Alex, anything uh, you want to chip in? We... No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I'm new to the group. I'm mostly just observing and listening and, uh, I'll, I'll be reading through the paper this week and, uh, see what contributions I might jump in with. To totally fine. Just join in on the Slack channel or just, what we're doing is just, uh, go in there and uh, assign it uh, a section to yourself and, and jump in any commentary, uh, very much welcome. Right. Okay, cool. So huge amount of progress last week. Um, you know, I think more refinement and more uh, contributions coming in. Um, I, I think uh, Emily was suggesting that by the end of next week, uh, you know, aiming to get uh, um, at least a decent run through the document ready for editing. I believe that was the sort of time frame she was looking at. Um, so if we can try and refresh the, each of our sections to make sure that they look in decent shape. And if we need sort of initial editorial review, maybe we can flag that as a, as a comment as well. And a couple of people can go back through it. Makes sense. Anders, any, any other thoughts? The week feels a little bit tight, but yeah. let's go for it. <laughs> you know, um, I'm happy to offer pseudo office hours, same time slot, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, if people want to jump in and work through things, that's the same as we rather break out. Uh, I feel we, we might need yet another week. I think we can we can push, but let's see. Well, we should start taking a lot of shape. Yep. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. And with that, I'll let Andy get back to his beer and wish everyone a, a really good... It's definitely beer. There's no way, man. Mm. <laughs> Friday, happy hour timing, okay, right? Yeah. There we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great weekend, everyone, and uh, catch up during the week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Right.
is. <laughs> hey, Jonathan. I'm just jealous, man. I'm just jealous. <laughs> I, I assure you. <laughs> I, assure, I assure you it's good stuff. Sorry, Carl. Uh, what, what kind of beer is that? Uh, it is Lucky Saint. Oh. Uh, that way. Saint. All right. Well, it's, uh, it's 11.30 right now, so I got 30 minutes before I can... <laughs> 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 it's the only positive side to this relationship between the, the two countries because half the time yeah. it's 6 p.m and everyone's bright as a button and jumped up on caffeine and i'm just like oh what's happened yeah. to the day so, uh, <laughs> oh i have a customer right now that's over in ireland so uh, same same uh, situation yeah exactly hey jonathan uh hey, are cool. we good on that uh that like base image that we kind of sidebarred on yeah, what, what, what I'm, I think so. What, what I'm trying to sort of suggest is, is as we building out the software factory, right, and we define what the opinionated pipelines are going to be. Maybe you have one for a Java image you're going to build, a Java project you're going to build, or Go project or whatever. Within that pipeline, I'd imagine that you select a, a number of different steps that you're going to put within each one of each yeah. one of those pipelines. So you would um, assemble those, those different steps or components. You'd have maybe a couple of linting tools. You'd have the build tool, you know, a couple of testing tools, perhaps some signing thing at the end of it. And you'd, you'd have your factory effectively chain all these things together, sign each one of them using in toto and such and, and distribute it. What I'm referring to is the, the, the way of building those individual images behind each one of those steps and ensuring that we highlight that you know, we need a pipeline that actually builds those steps and you need to ensure that you have the, the same level of security around uh, those builds, right? Don't just build your pipeline and then fill it full of stuff that you built yeah. on your laptop, right? Yeah, right. So, you know, we need, I think we, we I can go into the process kind of using those identities of, of management and how we do that. How do we bring in new images and how do we validate those images um, in order to be used into the, into the fact, in order so they can be used in the factory, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, because because I think that's really really important because um, th there's quite a lot of of detail that you should put in there to make sure that people aren't just pulling stuff straight off the web or, or just uh, you know again building something off the laptop and then using that as the sort of heart of the really super secure software yeah. factory. Yeah. Yeah, I can talk about, hey, you know, this is where we need to really understand the ideas of reproducibility and, you know, distributed trust uh, along these networks and kind of right. evaluate our risk of our of our build materials that we're bringing in that we're saying, hey, we trust these. Well, why do we trust them? What's our risk profile and how do we evaluate that? And then ultimately getting to the point where the software factory itself could be used as the mechanism to build those images and secure those images, right? So you kind mm -hmm. of sort of get itself to eat itself, but um you know, you, you do need a decent level of control when you're building that sort of stuff. Yeah, who was it? Oh, Mikhail actually gave me this quote. I don't know, is he still on the line? No, he's off, I think. No, he's not. But it was it was talking about how if you would have put like a vulnerability in like the C compiler 20 years ago, you could still be exploiting that today, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> So it's really important that we, we figure out that we had that trust as far as the images, you know, yeah, verified as much as, as possible. Absolutely. And and there was, I've been thinking also about the, um, you know, monitoring those individual components and steps, right? And, and the way I look at it, when you get to, you know, not all of those steps are equally important, or maybe they are, but, but certainly the build step is, is pretty damn important to make sure that no one's interfering with that build step and injecting code in that you you, you weren't expecting and such. Or, mm -hmm. or I guess what it really is, is anything that actually affects the end result other than sort of a test. So if you look at that, that particular component that's looking at that build, is there a mechanism we can put in place to monitor the behavior of that build step and ensure within certain parameters it does roughly the same thing? You know. yeah, we, we have the mechanisms for that right see so or uh, you know capabilities we have you know we have a lot of monitoring that we can hook into so. so so the way i was going was there was a really good uh, presentation about tracy um the ebpf monitoring tool from aqua okay. um and the yep. open ssf uh team did a presentation on it and i was thinking you know there's some 
interesting sort of tooling you could maybe build, bring to bear on that build uh, build component and see if you can learn from what what it usually looks like. Um, yeah, yeah. I want to, you know, I've been spending a lot of time on the code this week, and I, I one thing that I want to do is actually, you know, output traces from build steps and and just make that automatic, make that one of the the products, right? The trace right. for that build. Right. Popped out. Yeah, and, and, and then and, we can. And when we can build policy around that, right? Because we have it, we can create, you know, the in the Intoto layout. Say, hey, these are the only, you know, syscalls that are allowed. But yeah, exactly right, exactly. And and it got me thinking as well because I'd read this paper from uh, the ACM. Uh, I'll, I'll send it to you. I don't recall the name of it, but it was basically looking at. I think it was thoughts on the forensic output from a malware attack or something. It's not quite that, but basically they were they were saying that they'd analyzed. Um, open source libraries and then analyze, analyze the components after it'd been infested with malware. And, you know, there was like a, a thousand percent difference in the, the materials um, post exploitation. If you actually did a, a deep dive into, to, into the, the actual file structure, which, which makes complete sense. Right. But, but that sort of situation is a, is a monumental signal. So if we have that sort of diagnostics on that build step, that'd be pretty handy. And I think, um, what was the example that they were using the other night? I think it was basically looking eBPF and um, anti-debug or something like that. If someone switches anti-debug in the middle of your uh, your open source, you know, in your build step or, or with some of the other libraries that are getting used, it's a pretty good indication something weird's going on, right? Yeah. So I actually have an issue for this already, Jonathan. Um, so I think we're tracking. Oh, we did. Yeah. Yeah, cool. For the uh, for the instrument tracing in the Intoto, so I, I think we can talk about that at a high level, um, but yeah. definitely understand what you're talking about there. Yeah, nice. Yeah, cool, good. Yeah, just just some thoughts about it and yeah. some of the stuff we've been digging into um, around how to create those containers. Yeah, um, I saw some good code to do this too. I can probably just steal and get a, get something get something working for the next couple of weeks. Be fun to do. Yeah, one of the things uh, I've done in the past is um, you want to limit the capabilities of the container to just like literally the bare minimum, which is, mm -hmm. I think, goes yeah. back to some of the stuff I was talking about uh, before. Yeah. Like at, at previous spots, we just literally didn't give containers the network capability whatsoever. And so it just, you know, um, the thing that was doing the actual build would not have the ability to sort of go out to the, the network for anything, even if there was something else um you know uh, uh saying hey yeah go out or whatever mm -hmm. um and i think those sorts of things like you know uh the i can't remember what the it's some of this called in there but like the anonymized users inside of the containers and and ensuring that you know um yeah the capability is just completely separate from all the other namespaces yeah and, and that that's why it's important to how we're building those containers right so you know, put together that process of building it, constrain it to the absolute minimum you can get away with, and then use that. Yeah, but you also need that verification step. That's what all these build processes are missing is a verification, right? How does the end user actually verify that you did what you say you're going to do? There's, yeah, there's stuff. Yeah, well, so um, that's why, at least in the past, it's been, you know, you want to limit that blast radius where you say, okay, mm. I, I told it to just compile this one thing. That's all <laughs> I told it to compile. And so at least there I can maybe start to scan, you know, I, that's where I'm going to focus my scan. If you tell it, oh, I want it to compile these 10 things, then it's 10 things you need to worry about uh, yeah. that maybe, you know, it, on the third thing it compiled, it did something weird. And mm. so, um, and then in addition to that, I think, the thing that we've done is sort of like you have the build worker, which you kind of limit to a very, very small sliver of thing. And then you have a bunch of these other like helpers that do stuff like it will download all the, um, the dependencies and the sources and then just hand it a share, uh, network storage. It just hand it shared storage and say, hey, build worker, this is all you're doing. Like here's mm -hmm. all the only thing you have access to. And it'll do all that. And then ostensibly it should just write to a separate output storage. And then um, from there you can have additional processes to go and say, okay, well, the only thing it wrote was it wrote this one file. 
and I'm going to scan that file and, you know, look at all that sort of stuff. Whereas yeah. if you kind of give the build worker, you know, in the past, at least the, our concern was if you give the build worker too much permission to like, let's say push to the artifact repository directly, then, you know, and then say, okay, well, I'm going to download it and do another scan. Well, what happens if, you know, whatever that artifact did, like is hard to, I don't know. There, there's a lot of things there. Yeah. Yeah, and we need to set up that build. But let's say you're you're maintaining a, a, a CNCF project, right? And I'm consuming that project as a you know uh, as an end user. I need to be able to verify that you did what you said you're going to do, and not in a way that I'm trusting a human being, right? I, I need to trust trust some sort of cryptographic process that you limited the C groups or the the Linux capabilities during your build process. You uh, isolated your build environment and didn't have any network connections into that build environment, right? So I think yeah. what we're missing right now in the ecosystem is that ability to verify, right? That is not mature um, and, and is it out there. Um, I think we have the idea of reproducibility. That That's getting some maturity, but the idea of actually verification is not. Yeah, and, it, and it's not just the actual artifact you're building. What you're saying is the, the 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 ecosystem that is in place as you're building it. So it comes along with, like, the artifact and the the the, the metadata along with that artifact plus the metadata from the pipeline that was used to create the thing. That's quite powerful, right? Yeah. So I was reading um, some work. Uh, there's a uh, some folks in Japan at some university that I think were doing. Uh, trying to do this sort of thing through zero knowledge proofs of, hey, could you prove that a particular artifact was built in a particular way? It seemed like it was very, very early on with like, um, you know, a very narrow set of things. But um, yeah, I, I agree that that's kind of the, the biggest challenge, right? Because even if you sort of, um, even if you cryptographically sign, hey, here is my container manifest, right? Who's to say you actually use that container manifest um, in the output? And in the past, the thing that we've done is what you do is you take snapshots of all the build workers and whatever, and you kind of go back and, you know, if somebody says, hey, we want to validate this thing, you go back and you scan the container, you do some other things. It's still not ideal, but it's to some extent better than nothing. Could I just confirm what, what I think I'm understand for what I think I understand, which is when we're talking about injecting all the dependencies into a thing, into a build worker, in order to essentially have a hermetic build. In order to do that with a container-based system, you'd still presumably need to construct the container beforehand, and it's just that one stage of, art, uh, I want to say artifact compilation, but but actually source code transformation, I guess, into an artifact that we're talking about. Correct. And so the, the way that um, I've operated that in the past uh, was, once again, this is at a place that didn't trust Kubernetes, but the, the, uh, the thing was you would, have a, um, you would have a handful of containers, right? One container would just essentially set up the environment for the actual source code transformation step, whether it was compilation or packaging or whatever. Um, and so it would set all of that up into sort of a, sh uh, into one shared storage piece of shared storage. And then, um, there was actually sort of three pieces of, uh, storage that the container would have access to that the actual sort of build would have access to one is it would have read only storage of the inputs. It would have sort of a working storage for it to do all of its work. And then the last step would be to sort of take that and copy it to an output storage. Um, and, uh, and so, and then it would hand that off, right. It would just say, okay, now I'm done. And then, um, once that container sort of was, you know, uh, uh died or whatever, you know, it, it, it completed its action. Another container would come back on. It would go and do some basic sort of thing where we go in, validate some signatures on that artifact, and then, you know, push it to the uh, repository and write any additional metadata to an attestation database or something like that. Okay, that's um, it, it's really interesting pattern. I mean, I, I can see how I'm trying to model it onto the stuff that I'm sort of kicking around with Tecton at the moment, and uh, just, just kind of I guess just breaking stages up that bit more to give more transparency to composition. <laughs> okay, that, thanks for clarifying.
You're welcome. Well, okay. uh, we're going to have to drop, unfortunately, but thanks very much for your time. I'll, I'll leave you going. And uh, it's, uh, I'm really impressed, actually. There's a lot of good content coming into this document. I'm, I'm actually got some time with the weekend to go back through yeah. more to do, but cool. I just... Uh... I just hope we can get it done in time for a KubeCon presentation. That's that's my worry. I mean, I, I know we're going to get it done. Just that timeline scares me a little bit. Yeah, it does. Because you know, it's hard to a wrangle people right. to do free work. <laughs> right. I, I mean, w what I'm going to do is is just like just take a day and dedicate it to it because I think it's really important. Yeah. But yeah. I think uh, you can't you can't really you can't really ask more of people really graciously contributing a lot of energy into this right. Cool. All, All right. right. Leave you to it. Thanks, guys. I got to run too. Later. Thank you. Cheers. Top of the evening. Later. Hey, Michael. Sorry. Uh